Hi, this is Russ Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Welcome to lesson number 51 of the 52-week Baseline Bible Course. This is part three of the section on mountain moving prayer. If you'd like to have this course in a paperback book, you can get it from Amazon. Just go to Amazon and search for my name, Russell Walden, or search for Baseline 52-week Bible Course, and it's available and you can order it there. Now, let's continue talking about prayer. When we teach on prayer, we often look at the writings of Paul, like in Ephesians 6.18 about spiritual warfare. You also commonly hear teaching on the Lord's Prayer and the prayer life of Jesus. One of the things that hinders us is feeling like you fall short. I don't know about you, but I think my prayer life falls short of Paul's prayer life. Certainly falls short of Jesus prayer life. Not that we can't look at that example, but there are other examples that are just a little more close to home, a little more uh, in, uh, uh, with a little more affinity to where I live and breathe. Uh, when you feel like you're falling short, you're not good enough to see your prayers answers answered, that's a, a common enough problem for believers to the degree that uh, God inspired James to write the following passage to try and help out folks like you and I about getting our prayers answered. James chapter 5, verse 17. Elias was a man subject to passions just like we are. And he prayed earnestly, honestly, without pretense, that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. You have to know. You have to know that your prayers are effective because of who Jesus is. Why does he answer you? He answers you not because of who you are, but because of who Jesus is. Not who you are or what you've done. The message of James 5.17 is that Elijah was a man of many shortcomings. According to the scripture, we're made to know that there was nothing uncommon about Elijah's piety or his holiness. Like you and me, Elijah often fell short. Yet, Elijah learned the reality of answered prayer. The key, the secret to answered prayer. And you and I can learn it as well. So it might be helpful for us not only to study the prayers of examples of perfection like Jesus or Paul's prayer life, but let us also study the prayers of men whose lives were fraught with failure and controversy. King David is at the top of that list among all others. He stands out in this regard. He was a murderer he disobeyed God frequently. He had a wandering eye. He committed adultery. He spoiled his children so much, King David, that many of them died under the judgment of God. But yet David was a man after God's own heart whose prayers, more than any other biblical figure, even more than Jesus, the prayers of David have come down to us in great volume. We actually have more record of the prayers of David than any other biblical figure in the record of the Psalms, of course. So, with that in mind, let us look at the quality, and not just the quantity, but the quality and the character of David's prayer life. Now, in Psalm chapter 4, verse 1, Hear me when I call, David said. Hear me! <laughs> o God of my righteousness. Notice who his righteousness was. You have enlarged me when I was in distress, have mercy on me now and hear my prayer. Oh, I love the honesty of David's prayers. This is the first specific mention of prayer in the Psalms. David begins his prayer by making connection with God. Hear me, O God! See, he's focusing on the Father. He's making eye contact, as it were, with Jehovah. Uh, we, it's, it's bringing God to attend. Not that he's not attentive, but we need to be reminded of it. And then he talks about God and righteousness. See, he's coming to the Father on the basis of God's mercy and not on any merit of his own. David knew what he was made of. We don't need to hide who and what we are. He then reminds the Lord of past deliverance. And he asks God to have mercy on him and hear him. God has been good to David in the past and David is letting God know that he expects and hopes and has confidence in the same response to his current crisis. The things that he's done for you before, he's going to do again. He's never going to let you down. 
verse Psalm 4, 2. He said, O you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? We need to get the vanity out of our prayers. See? And in prayer, notice that David speaks to his enemies. Now, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but people are not just flesh and blood, and you need to be mature enough to know that. People have human spirits, and human spirits that are operating against God can oppress you just like a demon. And so when you pray, you speak to your enemies. He provoked his enemies to stop and meditate on the faithfulness of God. Now David wasn't standing in front of his enemies when he prayed this. He was warring in the secret place with spiritual warfare. Because words spoken even in the secret place have impact and influence on who they are directed to. A very potent, very powerful truth in prayer. So you speak to God in prayer. You speak to yourself in prayer, and you speak to your enemies. Now, what happens when you speak the word to the enemy? James wrote about this, the Apostle James. In James chapter 2, verse 19, he said, You believe there's one God? Well, the devils believe and tremble. The devils believe and tremble. So, why do they believe? Because they've heard the word. When you speak the word of God to the enemy... You're activating his own faith in the Word of God that's against him. And you make them participate in their own destruction. <laughs> See, this isn't the first activity to resort to in prayer. You start out talking to God. But there is a place to rebuke and resist by the words of your mouth. This isn't, let's pray silently and have wishful thinking. No, this is opening your mouth with verbosity, with bombastity <laughs> against the enemy in prayer. Look at verse 3 of Psalm 4. It said, Know that the Lord hath set aside him that is godly for himself. Who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. The Lord will hear me when I call. <laughs> so he's reminding his enemies that the Lord is going to hear him. And when you pray thoughts of unbelief, may taunt you, those thoughts may taunt you, but taunt them back. The enemy whispers that God won't hear you. He says your prayers are useless. You need to verbalize in return the expressions of your faith. My trust is in God. He heard me before. He's hearing me now. <laughs> and your confidence then arises not out of just your emotions or your mind, but out of your heart and out of your spirit where God lives. We need to solve. Look, you need to solve the problem of prayerlessness in your life. Psalm 4 verse 4. David said in prayer, stand in awe. Sin not. Don't miss this. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. So you have to turn to yourself. You have to speak to yourself in your prayer time. Comfort your heart. Instruct your heart like a child. David continually encouraged himself in the Lord. You need to learn to control. Listen to me. You need to learn to control the inner dialogue that is constantly going on in your mind. Your mind is not you. It's part of your soul. You are a spirit. And as such, you must marshal your mind. You must harness your mind and emotions. And sometimes you have to speak to yourself like a child and be self-correcting. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> if you won't, then who will? Psalm 103, verses 2 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He's talking to himself. Hey, soul, bless the Lord. Forget not all his benefits. The mind is quick to forget. The spirit will remind you. Who forgives all your... Look at all the iniquities He's forgiven you, soul. Look at... The, he's healed you. Look at all the diseases you haven't got. Hello? <laughs> Who redeems your life from destruction and He crowns you. You're a crowned soul with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies you, soul. He satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. See, you don't have to wait for a preacher to speak a powerful word to you. David knew the value of declaring over his own life. Say, well, that's just not how I was taught. Well, you need to change how you've been taught. He knew the value of declaring over his own life what his confidence and expectations in God were, and we need to follow his example. 1 Samuel 36. David was in a position where he was greatly distressed, and the people talked about stoning him because they were upset, because all of them had lost their sons and their daughters and their wives. And everybody was down on David. You ever have that? 
Why is everybody always picking on me? <laughs> what did David do? He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You need to learn to encourage yourself when others come against you. And look, let's get real. They're going to come against you. Don't give in to their evil opinions and reports. Take authority and bring yourself into check. Encourage yourself. Sequester yourself. Admonish yourself. David took responsibility for his own spiritual well-being, and you need to do that too. You must realize that the Father has placed you largely on your own recognizance. He's put you on your own recognizance when it comes to your spiritual life and growth. The Scripture says, sanctify yourself. You know, you can't leave these things to others. No matter how willing others are to be your spiritual sur surrogate, to pray for you, to teach you, you need to get these things for yourself. Lest you be found in the lurch and not able to get a hold of God in a time of crisis. Verse 5, Psalm 4. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. What are you offering the Lord when you come before Him? When you come to God in prayer, don't bring your religious performance or moral quality as though that would be the basis of expecting an answer. You never come before the Lord empty. What are the sacrifices of righteousness? These are what you offer the Lord in anticipation of answered prayer. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Of God are you in Christ Jesus. He's talking about who Jesus is to you. Who of God, who? Jesus of God is made unto you wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus is your righteousness. Your righteousness is a person. It's not a moral quality. It's not... Um, it's not a performance-based set of parameters by which you approach God. See, God only hears the prayers of the righteous. In the Old Covenant, men who were righteous did so through an adherence to ceremonial law and the frequent offering of animal sacrifice. But in the New Covenant, we are not rendered acceptable to God through religious ritual but by virtue of who Jesus is and what he did for us. God told me one time, he says, Son, when I look at you, I see the lamb that was slain. That's the basis on which I answer your prayers. Jesus is your righteousness. It is his person that gives you standing before the Father in prayer. Psalm 4, 6. So there be many who say, who will show us any good? You know, there's always the negative. Lord, lift up the light of your countenance, even in bad times. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You need to ask God at times. You know, and communicate with Him. Lord, this is what they're saying when people come against you. It is true, God knows all, but He wants you to rehearse back to Him what you know He already knows. The circumstances you're facing. The criticisms of others. David is very honest in his prayers. He doesn't try to con God by his inflection or coming with a religion, oh, most merciful Heavenly Father. No. He sees the person of God as his answer. So he can come to God even when he's in total failure, even when you've made every error, when you've made every wrong decision. Like David, you could come before God because Jesus is your righteousness. See? And the following Psalm, David, is very blunt. You need to be real honest. Oh, God, just save them. No, you don't want God to save them. You really want him to bust their teeth out. <laughs> David's very blunt about he wants, what he wants to happen to his enemies. Is that God's will? Probably not. Was God mad at David for speaking so directly? No. He accepted David's transparency and his honesty and rewarded him for it. Look at it. Psalm 58, 6. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. You hear what he's praying for his enemies? That's just honesty. Psalm 35, 1. Plead my case, O Lord, with those that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. You know, the Lord's taught me, are you my enemy? God fights against my enemies. Psalm 35, verse 5 through 6. Let them be as the chaff before the wind. And let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. Let destruction come upon them unawares. You see how David's praying? Let his net that he hath hid catch himself into the very destruction, let him fall. David prayed very honest prayers. 
You don't come with him with all that false altruism. He said, God, just destroy my enemies and my soul will be joyful. David was totally honest and he spoke with transparency. You can come to God. You can trust him. Transparency in prayer is a key to the answers that David received and the answers that you're going to receive and the relationship with God that you will enjoy because you're setting aside pretense. But it's interesting that when David's enemies did suffer, let's look and see what he actually did. Psalm 35, 13, he said, As for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. Now he asked God to break their teeth out, but when it happened, he fasted for them. He said he humbled his soul, and his prayer returned to his own bosom. I behaved myself as though they'd been my friend or brother. I bowed myself down heavily as one that mourns for his mother. You see what he did? He was honest. God, I want you to break their teeth out. I want you to break their arm. But then when it happened, he mourned and he fasted for him. Isn't that wonderful? That's what your prayer life needs to be like. David reminds God, God, I came to the aid of my enemies. Tell God what you've done right and what you've done wrong. Those who were smitten in response to David's prayer. This is the honest, transparent, and absence of guile that you must demonstrate if you expect and hope for answers in prayer. Do not roll out the king's English or try to manipulate God with fair, dishonest speeches. Verse 7. David continues, he says, You put gladness in my heart, God, more than the time of corn and wine when it is increased. When it comes to provision and supply, David speaks out his confidence in God. He prays, notice he prays the answer and not the problem. He speaks his faith concerning his present circumstance. He calls those things that are not as though they were. When you pray, Learn how to conclude. I mean, you need to get it all out. It's like, come on, baby, just tell me what you think. But then as you conclude your prayer, you need to start praying out the answer and say, God, as bad as it is, I'm trusting you. And you need to tell God what you know He's going to do. In case I forget to tell you, God, uh, thanks for answering this prayer. Don't get so self-focused that the prayer you pray is reduced to a gripe fest. We need to fear God, approach Him with transparency, and conclude with confidence and respect. And then say what it's going to be afterwards. Psalm 4.8. He says, I'm going to lay me down in peace and I'm going to sleep tonight because God, you got a phone call. <laughs> because God, you're the only one that can make me dwell in safety. you got to put your concerns to bed in prayer. There is such a thing as praying through. The old timers used to know that. Generations past have understood this. David also spoke predictively when he prayed. He tells God, I know what's going to happen. You're going to be faithful. As a result of my prayers, you're going to bring answers. Answers are on the way, God, and I know it. In effect, David's prophesying his future. He puts his trust in the Lord, and he lays the issue to rest. Let that be how you start praying this week. Pretense in prayer is a sure way not to get an answer. David's prayers were honest, transparent, and they always concluded upbeat with just expecting and saying, God, I know you're faithful. He talked to God without changing his demeanor or adopting some self-righteous tone. David cried out to God without trying to manipulate him like a spoiled child. As you pray this week without pretense and you pray in honesty, trusting in what Jesus has done for you as the basis of your answer, not what you're doing for Jesus, you're going to see the same results that David himself enjoyed in terms of Answers and blessing and deliverance. Apply this to your prayer life. You're going through problems or difficulties? Let's pray like David prayed. And you're going to see the results that David enjoyed. God bless you. We look forward to next week.